Welcome to the Byline Times podcast. My name's Adrian Goldberg. The Byline Times telling you what the papers don't say and reporting it without fear or favour. This time, the monarchy and the media after Harry and Meghan's explosive US TV interview leaves UK tabloid editors facing some awkward questions. The way that they have been frothing at the mouth with hatred over Meghan is horrific and there doesn't seem to be any recognition of it. There is an unwillingness to to even have a conversation about it. And more on the royal family later, as we hear how they've cosied up to Middle Eastern dictators despite the cruel suppression of the Arab Spring. There's the famous incident of Prince Charles taking part in a sword dance in Saudi Arabia to help promote a massive arms deal with BAE Systems, Britain's biggest uh, arms dealer to sell these Typhoon fighter jets, which are used very heavily by Saudi Arabia in the war in Yemen, to bomb the population there. And that's become the world's worst humanitarian disaster. And MP Jess Phillips responds to the story that McDonald's once turned the Golden Arches upside down to mark International Women's Day. (laughs) I mean, I I didn't know about that until now, and I'm going to give up, you know. Elected office, fighting for rights. It's over now because they, they turn the arches upside down. Yeah, like, we won. <laughs> All that to come. First, a reminder that the Byline Times relies on people like you to help us hold the powerful to account. There's no media baron behind us, no corporate backer. We survive and thrive on subscriptions to our monthly paper, the Byline Times. It is a great read and in buying it, you're helping to support our website, bylinetimes.com, this podcast and Byline TV. A subscription costs just £36 a year and you can get more details on how to subscribe at bylinetimes.com. Thank you very much indeed if you have already subscribed. Now, in the wake of Harry and Meghan's interview with Oprah Winfrey, two mighty British institutions have been accused of racism. The royal family and our tabloid press. Prince Harry paid inadvertent tribute to the power of the papers when he blamed them for the couple's move to the United States. He described them as bigoted, but also said the royals didn't speak up for Meghan because they didn't want to upset tabloid editors who they rely on for good publicity. What he described as the invisible contract. Meghan also talked openly about her suicide fears, the sneering reaction to which has already cost one tabloid TV presenter, Piers Morgan, his job. For a more considered response, I brought together Byline Times editor Hardeep Matharu and Marvareen Duffy, freelance broadcaster and journalist and director of undergraduate journalism at Birmingham City University. The interview was really saddening. I watched the section of Megan explaining what had happened uh, over the years. And I was just, call me naive, but I was gobsmacked at the fact that she said that the palace and the, the, the engineering at the palace, so to speak, had not wanted to correct these headlines, which were really wrong. You know, there were fundamental things that were going wrong when she explained that Kate had made her cry and, and and it wasn't the other way around, that the palace didn't want to correct those headlines. And I was gobsmacked by that, genuinely. I, I was, I, call me naive, as I said, I was thinking, why would they do that? Why would they not say anything? Why would they stay silent so that these hideous allegations were just regurgitated and amplified and screamed louder and louder every day in the media. So that shocked me. And of course, what shocked me was her revelation that she did not want to be left alone in one particular evening when Harry and her were meant to be going out to some awards do because she didn't know what she would do because she feared for what she would do because she wanted to take her own life, her life and that of her unborn child. I mean, this is horrific. I cried and cried and cried watching that. I'd like to think that the interview is a watershed moment for them and that they can live freely beyond this now and they don't have to address any of this anymore. And on a level around the tabloids, and it's the right-leaning tabloids, I mean, we know this anyway, don't have to explain this, but I did have to reinforce it and explain it to my students when I was discussing this story with them on Friday so that they understand who's saying what and why and from what position you know they're coming from. One of the reasons I didn't want to study journalism when I was 18 was that I read these papers 
And the only course of getting into being a journalist was to study an NCTJ qualification and have a traineeship with one of these papers. I read them as a, as a youngster and went, no way, because these papers are not for me. The journalists writing the stories are not for me. I don't want to learn in that environment. I don't want to be a journalist. And I didn't turn to this profession until another 12 years after that. When you say it was not for you, are you referring to that specifically as a black young woman, as you were? Yeah, absolutely. As a black woman, any stories written about black women as a dusky beauty, you know, it was really pathetic, but you knew there was a racial bias to the tones and descriptions of black people, of Asian people. There was so much titillation, titivation and all these kind of sex stories in a lot of papers. And I was just like, this is not the industry for me. It doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem to want me. It seems to actually look at me and go, who are you? What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing in this country? You're not British. That's what I felt oozing from all these right-leaning papers. It's gotten better, but you can still sense that. And you only have to look at the headlines that have happened over the over the last few years regarding Meghan and the way that, oh, why is Meghan keep touching her baby bump? But Kate is cradling her baby bump and it's okay and all this all this sort of thing to me it screams of racial bias and what's worrying and concerning for me as well teaching the journalists of the future who will be the agenda setters and the hirers and firers of the future hopefully it says to those students many of whom are from the midlands from black asian and minority ethnic backgrounds LGBTQ students, a diverse, ethnically and socially diverse bunch. It says to them, we don't want you. We don't want your kind in this industry. We'll do everything we can to prevent you from joining this industry. That's my worry. You know, I watched the interview and I was disgusted and devastated when Megan talked about conversations that had happened with Harry by members or a member of the royal family or the royal household about the how dark his unborn baby skin colour may or may not be. In a way, it was just so simple, but this is what it still boils down to. And I found it so devastating because for those of us who live these issues of structural racism in our everyday lives. Meghan and Harry and them doing this interview isn't just some big distraction or two really privileged people selfishly moaning and we should all just forget about it and get on to more important things. For me, that, that interview isn't just about the monarchy, it's about where power really lies in Britain. This notion of colour is interesting because the notion of colourism whereby People with fairer skin are considered of higher status or more beautiful. That is absolutely found in sort of the community, the Asian community that I come from. I've always been very aware of it. Both my parents are Indian Punjabi descent. I have very fair skin and red hair. To the extent where I've even been told that I kind of transcend my race and class in British society. And just hearing that about archy skin colour, it just in a very simple way, I think, encapsulates so much of what is at the heart of this. And it's so insidious, you know, it's so insidious. And I think another aspect of this, which hasn't really been looked at, again, is Harry made some really important comments about the tabloid media. So he was saying that a large part of the reason why he decided to move to America was because he didn't feel supported by the royal household. As Marvin's saying about these stories that were coming out about Meghan, which were not true, these weren't being corrected. And he was saying that I'm acutely aware that the royal family is actually quite scared of the tabloid media in Britain. And so there's, and he called it an invisible contract between them, whereby if you, you'll get good coverage if you sort of wine and dine and keep on the right side of the right wing press which does still dominate the mainstream media and has real questions around how diverse it is. And I think that was just such an important point that if 
a member of the royal family. You can't get more sort of within the institution than Prince Harry is saying, we have a royal family that feels beholden to the media. I mean, we can only just guess at what elected politicians feel in terms of the mainstream media. The, The media has a lot of cultural power. And it seems there is this interesting nexus whereby one element of the establishment elite, the royal family, is quite hollow, really, at the heart of it. The only reason they're all there is by the accident of birth. There isn't really anything else at the core of it. But to stay kind of relevant, it relies on this public perception being created in cahoots with another element of the establishment leaped in this country, which is the mainstream media. And so for me, what was so revealing about the whole interview was where does power really lie? And I think Britain has big problems of racism, of white supremacy, of class entitlement, unearned privilege, and really different elements of establishment elites, first and foremost, trying to protect themselves. You know, this is all wrapped up in... I think what Britain really is. And for me, something that was really striking was when Meghan was asked by Oprah about the various sort of tours and the events that they go on. And she was saying, let me just say, nothing is ever like it looks. In Britain, she said there's an obsession with how things look, which is very different to how you actually feel. And I just think that is still, that is so telling. So I was quite surprised and a little bit saddened that some you know, some people who you may consider quite liberal, but quite dismissive of the interview in that. Like I said, it's just two celebrities moaning. We need to move on from this. It's a big distraction. Who cares? But it does matter. They're not just merely symbols. They're representing some really important fault lines, I think, in British culture. It's really interesting as well that the representative of the Society of Editors has been wheeled out on various programmes to deny that the British press is racist. But a quick scan on Twitter will pull up any number of headlines from right-wing tabloids like the Daily Mail saying, migrants, how many more we can take? Tell us the true number of EU migrants. The weaponization of migrants in the media. Yeah, without a doubt. Add to that the fact that the European Commission on Racism said in 2016 that two newspapers are accused of fueling prejudice in a report on the rising racist violence and hate speech in the UK. You know, that was a study by the European Commission against racism and and intolerance. You know, these things are happening. They are real. People are speaking out about them. There are organisations speaking out about them. You know, the Muslim Council of Britain speaks about them. Journalists of colour often write, you know, open letters saying the industry is ignoring this. And I find it fascinating that the Society of Editors press release said, we've celebrated Harry and Meghan. Yes, you did. We're not arguing that. But how many other days of the of the year you're absolutely blasting her for some reason or another. I just want to be very clear. It's not all newspapers. We know it's not all newspapers, but there's a certain section who are very much leaning in towards policy and the government and a certain view and their audiences, their traditional audiences. And the way that they have been frothing at the mouth with hatred over Meghan is horrific and there doesn't seem to be any recognition of it. There is an unwillingness to to even have a conversation about it. And if there's an unwillingness, then that says to me, and we know that the work needs to happen, there needs to be more work. There are few black, Asian minority, ethnic senior leaders in some of these news organisations where decisions are made about what makes headlines and what doesn't. And until the industry takes a good hard look at itself. And yes, it's great. Lots of entry level jobs, get them in, train them up, get them out there. But if organisations do not look at the experienced journalists that are within their ranks and until they stop overlooking, excluding black journalists for promotion, excluding them from higher decision-making roles, There'll always be that blockage and that ignorance and that unwillingness to see racism from the point of view of those with lived experience. 
Absolutely. It's not just about who is in management and editorial positions. I think it's also, and we've spoken about this before, Adrian, on the podcast, it's also about how people of ethnic minority and diverse backgrounds are being recruited into journalism or not, as the case might be. You know, I think there are certain barriers which mean that journalism and the media is not viewed as a career path for people from those communities. I think the fact that significant elements of the mainstream media also exhibit a racialization in its reporting doesn't help at all. So it's definitely sort of what's going on on the management level, what's going on to recruit a more diverse pool of journalists. I think it's really telling this whole sort of moment about the lens through which we look at certain issues. Obviously, that has been very important and stark when we look at race. I think the other one is also mental health. I mean, it's very sad when Megan was saying that she didn't want to be alive anymore. I mean, that is, for anyone to say that, is absolutely horrific. It's a very, very big thing for her to admit. I think she'll empower a lot of people by doing it. I also think there's an interesting issue about the intersection between race and and mental health, which still isn't talked about enough. Racism plays a big role in why people are experiencing mental health down, you know, generate intergenerational trauma, the trauma of a structurally racist society and how you have to cope with that. I think, again, the lens that that's been looked through is these are really shocking revelations. And but it's just the fact that we have an institution whereby you've got two individuals who've had to leave and go to another country because it appears to be so damaging. And Harry said, I felt trapped in the system. That's what he actually referred to his life and the royal family as. as. And he said, I think my brother and my father are still trapped in the system. They're all trapped. And again, it raises questions about why do we have such a damaging institution which traps people, which doesn't seem to do much beyond provide some sort of symbolic figurehead who people have a lot of respect for because she's the queen. Why do we have these institutions, which are then in cahoots, it appears, with the tabloid media, which is keen to make money by exploiting the lives of of the royals who didn't really ask to be in that position, but were born into it. You know, it's it's very, it's it's a very kind of almost toxic web of things going on, but it sits right at the heart of what Britain is, or a constitutional monarchy. And yet we don't question any of these things deeply enough to question whether they're holding Britain back at all. There was a moment when Meghan Markle arrived in the life of Prince Harry and they got married and there was an embrace by many people of Meghan Markle, a black American princess. But there was also kickback. And I just wonder for this kind of strange institution that the royal family is, the fact that it's the head of the Commonwealth, this union of supposed the union of former empire countries to embrace but then appear to reject a woman of colour. What that says globally, you just wonder how damaging that is. We want to be seen in the world, particularly in this post-Brexit era, as welcoming, as outward-looking. When you look at the monstering of Meghan, that tells you something very different about Britain. Without a doubt, the damage has been done. If newspapers lament about, you know, that the palace's worst crisis, well, the palace brought it on themselves. This interview and the impact that it has on the monarchy's pulling power, tourism power, the impression it has on the world and the impact it has on the world is now vastly diminished, I think. My mum's from Jamaica. England was the mother country. My mum and dad came here in the 50s in response to the Queen's call, part of the Windrush era. I've spoken to her, I've spoken to friends of mine who are also of Jamaican heritage, you know, we're second generation and we're just thinking, I used to be a royalist, not interested now, because if that's your welcome for a woman of mixed heritage whose mum's African-American, we don't want it, thank you. It's also really sad because it kind of reinforces the fact that you're just never going to be accepted in this country as a black, Asian or minority ethnic person. person. No matter if you're born here, you're not going to be accepted. 
get used to it. That's the way it is. And and I can take that from the messages that I've had from close friends who are very, very upset, other black women who are extremely upset about the entire situation and, and the whole way that our newspaper media, some sections of the news media have conducted themselves. That is the impression that is left, unfortunately, that there are some of us where we're not really British, I think, and it'd be very difficult for us to ever be accepted as such in the eyes of some people who happen to be the echelons of, of power. So that is very hard to, to deal with. The message it gives to Commonwealth is absolutely atrocious. They've lifted the lid, Meghan and Harry, on what the heart of the British cultural, political and social society really is. And for that, I think they should be applauded. And it will have repercussions for years to come, I think. Byline Times editor Hardeep Matharu with Marvereen Duffy. And there's loads more great analysis of the Harry and Meghan story on the Byline Times website. We'll have more about the Royals later on this podcast too. I'm Adrian Goldberg and you're listening to the Byline Times podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to our brilliant monthly paper, the Byline Times, which pays for our website and this podcast. More details at bylinetimes.com. Now to mark International Women's Day, Byline Times commissioned four exclusive stories by our reporter Sean Norris. They're all well worth reading, but the one that really caught my eye was about the gender pay gap amongst companies who supported an International Women's Day campaign launched by a London-based consultancy, Aurora Ventures Europe Limited. Aurora were high profile. Type International Women's Day into Google and the company's website was the first to appear. But Sean discovered that many of the firms who had signed up were bigger on words than action, and they had rather large differences between what they paid men and what they paid women. It's worth pointing out here that the gender pay gap doesn't reflect any difference between what men and women earn for doing the same job. It's illegal to discriminate now like that. Rather, it is an assessment of average earnings, so it tells us who earns the big bucks and has the power in a company. Men or women. Jess Phillips, the Birmingham MP, well known for her staunch feminism, joined us to give her reaction. But first, Sean Norris, and why she decided to look into this in the first place. I started researching this story because I was really intrigued by this idea that we had an official International Women's Day campaign that had a a large range of corporate partners and supporters. Number one, because International Women's Day is a grassroots movement I, I didn't really understand why this sort of official website had appeared and and why it was being organized by a, a London-based consultancy but then when I started looking at who the partners were some really surprising names came up names that kind of raised some suspicions about what their gender pay gaps would be so I had a look I got out the uh, government reporting system that they do for the gender pay gap I put together a spreadsheet and started writing down all the numbers and unsurprisingly almost every single organization linked to this International Women's Day campaign did have some sort of gender pay gap. I mainly focused on the median hourly wage gap because obviously you could look at different ones, you could look at the mean hourly wage, you could look at the bonus gap but for me the median one just seemed like a sensible place to start. And the highest pay gap that I found through looking at it was for this organization called Honeywell which was 38%. But even organisations that had no sort of median hourly wage pay gap, such as McDonald's, still had a bonus pay gap. So even where you could see improvements had been made, there were still issues around making sure that women and men had equal pay. So what I wanted to do with this article and what I wanted to do by looking through all this data was to kind of say, look, International Women's Day isn't an opportunity for your organisation to do some nice tweets maybe host a panel saying how much you care about women's rights. International Women's Day is a movement that is grounded in women's working rights that came out of a kind of left-wing socialist trade unionist tradition. And if you're going to use the day to promote yourself as a forward-thinking organisation, then you need to do more to actually support the women that you employ. 
From my perspective, Sean, I totally agree with you. It's very weird to think that International Women's Day has a sponsor, full stop. It's a bit like we see Pride is sponsored in London by Barclay Card often. I find my feminism sponsored by Tesco seems like an odd place for us to be anyway. But for a long, long time, I think now, for the past 10 years, International Women's Day has been considered to be one of the sort of opportunities like Mother's Day before it, like there's Easter bonnets in Poundland right now. There's just an opportunity to sell people something, which I could be incredibly cynical about. But if it makes them have to talk about women and it makes them have to care and it makes the potential for the kind of reporting that you have done possible for them to next year not want to be in the same position I don't think next year they'll be like oh forget International Women's Day that'll get us in trouble I think they'll think well actually we've got a struggle for the reporting my overall view of the reporting which is currently on hold at the moment because of the uh, the pandemic because of course in a global pandemic in an economic downturn that has been notably affecting women worse we wouldn't want businesses to have to be collecting that sort of data I'm not entirely sure why it's been stopped but it has and the government seem to be making no moves to get it back which they absolutely should be because we don't know what's happening in the world at the moment and that's a real worry but I I don't think it's enough just to say yes we have a gender pay gap and put it into a report so that around this time of year and year end every year we get a story about which companies are good and which companies are rubbish and then it sort of goes away There's got to be some metal behind gender pay gap reporting that means that next year it's fallen. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that everybody's gender pay gap reporting is going to be brilliant every year or when it first started. But I would expect to see progress. And when there's no progress, what are we going to do about it? And so all those companies that you've looked into for International Women's Day this year who sponsored it, I don't know what they did to sponsor it. I did not receive any gifts <laughs> did not receive. as a woman I was not like you know if it's sponsored by it I did not I did not get a goodie bag of these products for all women you know the International Women's Day in Russia is essentially people walk the streets and give out flowers to women I'm gonna say we should bring that on here as well but the reality is is that those organizations next year that's gonna be the thing that matters is whether that's lesser Whether there's the 38%, bear in mind that 38%, that's somebody being paid like 62 pence for every pound a man earns. That's unbelievably bad. That's worse than the national average. What the hell are they going to do about that? I don't want a fancy website or a goodie bag. I want to know what the hell they're going to do about that. Absolutely. I want to be clear that they're listed as supporters, not sponsors, because I don't know as you say what that relationship means I mean sponsorship would suggest like a money or a financial transaction and and I don't know that so so yeah they were listed as supporters but I think completely agree with Jess number one we absolutely should not be suspending gender pay gap reporting at a time when women's working rights are clearly being seen to go into reverse. And there's a lot of data around about the impact on furlough on women workers. We know that women are more likely to be in low paid professions such as the care industry, which as we've seen over the past year has become an essential key working profession. And yet we're not seeing improvements in women's pay in that sector. So the fact that they've suspended reporting at a time when we need it more than ever to see the raw data on the economic impact on women workers in this crisis is really troubling. And I completely agree that International Women's Day is an opportunity to start these conversations. It's good in that respect that businesses have kind of taken hold of this and gone, okay, we're going to start conversations about women, but it has to go, as Jess says, beyond that conversation. You can't have one day of a year when we go, you know, McDonald's turned their M sign upside down to be a W a few years ago. It's like, oh, that's all I've ever wanted as a feminist, (laughs) to to go down the street and see a W. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I I didn't know about that until now, and I'm going to give up, you know. Elected office, fighting for rights. It's over now because they, they turn the arches upside down. Yeah, like, we won. <laughs> <laughs> Jess, the reporting of gender pay, though, is in itself a milestone, isn't it? And it allows us to have this discussion because we can now say we know what we're talking about with some authority, even if it has been suspended for this year because of the pandemic. But as a parliamentarian, 
Is there anything more that you could envisage doing? Is there any chance, for example, of, I don't know, abolishing the gender pay gap in law? Or is that just an unrealistic pipe dream? I mean, it is It is in law abolished. I mean, the Equal Pay Act of the 1970s is intended to abolish it. The issues where we go wrong and the, the legislation that would massively improve this is largely around parental legislation. So equalising men's parental rights with women's, while some, they've gone some way to doing such things where you can share a period of leave. Actually, most women don't want to give up their leave, A, eh, because they're ill. <laughs> it's quite hard to give birth to a baby. I mean, I gave birth to a £10, 10 ounce one. It took a while for me to get over that. And they, they want that time. But why on earth do we have to pick which parent gets the time? I think that there needs to be far, far more done to make sure that men's caring responsibilities are recognised in the law in a way that they aren't at the moment. That would be a massive, massive help. But also issues around flexible working, which the argument for them no longer exists. For years, I've sat through various gender pay gap meetings where people have been like, well, you know, it's very difficult because what about people who don't have kids? And it's like, well, you know what, I'm I'm not saying it's about your kids. I'm saying it's about any care responsibility of anyone you perceive to have any care for. Now the argument that we couldn't work from home, that we couldn't have flexibility, and even like when you go to people like teachers and night shift workers and nurses, which was always the thing that got thrown back at you all for some people, this will never work. The reality is, if we have the investment and uh, in, in both time, finances and energy in making this work, we massively improved, massively. And the massive improvements in childcare would make a huge, huge difference. So those are the ways that you legislate for it. But you, can le- you could legislate for fines, tax incentives. You could legislate for all sorts of financial things off the back of the reporting that says if you don't do it, And if you don't do it, you're breaking the law, essentially. But if you don't have policies that look after sexual harassment in your workplace, nothing bad happens to you. But that's illegal as well. So many of the things that happen in companies that is illegal, and if it was tested in a court of law, would be found to be illegal, have very little teeth. And so nothing ever changes. I totally agree. And I think the other thing that would be really good to see would be for gender pay gap reporting to go to more companies. I've never in my entire career worked somewhere with, I think, more than 20 employees, <laughs> you know, so but I know that gender pay gaps exist in these places. And I think if we could see that kind of extended so that we can get a bigger picture and, and put that responsibility on all types of companies, because that's another get out that allows companies to sort of not take any action when action does need to be taken. And it puts the onus on women who are not being paid fairly to do all the work. And most women who've gone through a gender pay gap situation will tell you it is just not worth the risk going to a tribunal because then you're the troublemaker. So you just, you pack up your bag, you pack up your desk and you go to another job and nothing gets changed. I agree with everything that Jess has said around flexible working, care, parental rights, but also ensuring that we we get this reporting out into the wider workplace and support women to take action and know that they're not going to be penalised for it. Byline Times reporter Sean Norris with Labour MP Jess Phillips, the Shadow Minister for Domestic Violence and Safeguarding. Aurora Ventures Europe Limited, who organised that International Women's Day campaign, did not respond to Byline Times' request for a comment. It's also well worth checking out all of Sean's features for International Women's Day on our website bylinetimes.com. That's also where you'll find details and how to subscribe to our fab monthly paper, The Byline Times. Now we heard earlier about the royal family and its troubled relationship with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, Harry and Meghan to you and I, but what else are the royals up to? Well, as Phil Miller from the investigative website Declassified UK discovered, they have been cozying up to dictators in the Middle East's Gulf states. That's despite the brutal suppression of human rights since the pro-democracy Arab Spring protests a decade ago. Prince Charles alone has had 95 meetings with Middle Eastern rulers in the last 10 years. Phil has been telling me all about it, starting with a quick refresher on the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring was a series of protests and revolutions that swept the Middle East and North Africa 10 years ago. 
they started in Tunisia and they saw the dictatorships in, in Egypt and Tunisia fall and other countries as well went into civil war or just saw massively increased repression of a whole range of, of activists. In some countries, even people putting tweets on social media could be arrested. So it was a moment when the the real nature of these monarchies in the Middle East and other dictatorships out there became obvious and no one could really pretend any longer that they had some kind of consent of their populations to be in charge. That was kind of a key moment and it's been 10 years since and in all of the eight monarchies in the Middle East, the various kings are still in power and they've spent the last 10 years embarking on on a counter-revolution and really trying to stamp out those last embers of dissent to quite an extraordinary degree in, in, in some countries. And in most cases, these were grassroots uprisings, ordinary people looking to countries like Britain and the West and aspiring to something similar to the kind of democracy and freedom of speech that we enjoy. Yes, in, in many of the countries, people were calling for multi-party elections, freedom of speech, even things as basic as kind of anti-corruption type demands, very reformist demands, even in some cases, accepting a kind of constitutional monarchy in the case of Bahrain. So some kind of accommodation with the existing power structure, but, you know, to, to have much more of their own rights and, and ideally the right to vote. And your headline revelation is that British royals have met the leaders of these monarchies, which you describe as tyrannical more than 200 times since that Arab Spring. Yeah, I was quite astonished when I started going through the court circular, which is the royal diary, and just the sheer scale of of these meetings that they were having. And often around the times of activists being put on trial and, and, and sentenced to very lengthy prison sentences, just for asking for their rights. In Bahrain, there was a case where a woman tore up a, a photo of the of the king of Bahrain and, and she was arrested. And, you know, there were meetings going on all around these events. It, the level of repression never seemed to put them off, either being invited to Buckingham Palace and Clarence House or the royals going out at taxpayers' expense on these trips around around these countries. Yes, Bahrain in particular seems very keen on maintaining this royal connection with the UK. Yes, so we found Bahrain had the highest level of meetings, I think around 44 meetings, so even more than the Saudis managed to get in with the House of Windsor. The King of Bahrain is very keen on on horse riding. He shares that passion with the Queen, and we saw almost every year since 2012, he would join the Queen at the Royal Windsor Horse Show and and sit next to her. One chap I interviewed, Syed Al-Wadai, who was tortured during the Arab Spring and fled to the UK and claimed asylum. He went to the Windsor Horse Show and and did a protest there and was um, obviously stopped from protesting quite quickly. But then his Bahraini citizenship was was stripped in retaliation. And when he tried to protest again, members of his family in Bahrain were summoned to the police station for questioning. So, you know, even the extent of people trying to do a democratic protest on British soil, they were suffering retaliation in the Gulf. So it became quite sinister, actually, when you really drill down into the detail of of what was going on. How repressive is Bahrain to ordinary people seeking to exercise what we would regard as normal democratic freedoms? Bahrain is highly repressive. It's rated by Freedom House, a US government funded think tank, as, as not free. The major opposition parties have been banned. Independent newspapers have been shut down. The leaders of the pro-democracy movement in Bahrain were sentenced to life imprisonment by a military court. So it can't get much more repressive than that. And you mentioned that behind Bahrain, Saudi Arabia is the next most common country for meetings with UK royals. Exactly, yes. I mean, Bahrain is a a relatively small, it's probably one of the smallest countries in, in the Middle East, and it's joined by a bridge to Saudi Arabia. And when the protests in Bahrain were getting to a critical level, the Saudis drove over the bridge in British-made armoured vehicles to crush the uprising. And Saudi Arabia had its own protests, particularly in the east of Saudi Arabia, from the Shia community. And you know, also these cases of women wanting to drive, 
there was the case of Rafe Atawi, who was a, a liberal blogger who was sentenced to hundreds of lashes. So there were all these human rights cases that have been going on and are still going on in Saudi Arabia. And yet the, the UK royal family had, I think, around 40 meetings with them. And also there's the famous incident of Prince Charles taking part in a sword dance in Saudi Arabia to help promote a massive arms deal with BAE Systems, Britain's biggest uh, arms dealer to sell these Typhoon fighter jets, which are used very heavily by Saudi Arabia in the war in Yemen to bomb the population there. And that's become the world's worst humanitarian disaster. So there are serious questions to ask about, particularly Prince Charles's relationship with the Saudis and the humanitarian consequences of it. Prince Charles is someone who portrays himself as a defender of faith. He claims to have a particular interest in Islamic culture and heritage. And yet the Saudi regime has been bombing the capital of Yemen Sana'a relentlessly for the last five years. Sana'a is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's one of the oldest cities in the world. And also Saudi Arabia represses religious minorities within its own borders. So I think there are serious questions for Prince Charles. He tries to portray himself as this very worldly and humanitarian figure and is likely to be our next king and head of state as to what he really gets up to in Saudi Arabia. And the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia, MBS, as he is known, has been implicated in the murder of a journalist, Jamal Khashoggi. Exactly. And that that murder took place only about six or eight months after Mohammed bin Salman had been welcomed to Buckingham Palace for a state visit. And the royal family allowed themselves to take part in, in a massive foreign office PR drive to present Mohammed bin Salman as, as a reformer. You had Boris Johnson writing op-eds in the Times saying, Mohammed bin Salman is a reformer and he deserves to be given a chance. And yet within months, he had orchestrated the killing and gruesome dismemberment of Jamal Khashoggi, who had criticised Saudi Arabia for the war in Yemen. So all these things are linked. And, and also a year after that murder, we found Prince Andrew was still having a meeting with the Saudi ambassador in London. So again, I mean, it's, it's very strange that we don't know what's said at these meetings. It's, it's almost impossible to find out. And yet the British royal family are allowed to have this, this kind of ongoing diplomatic relationship with these Gulf regimes. And Prince Andrew, the Duke of York, after he was pictured with the convicted paedophile Jeffrey Epstein in 2011, stood down from his role as an official UK trade envoy but you've discovered that he continued having these high-profile meetings with Middle Eastern royals. Exactly. So Prince Andrew was able to keep having a a sort of diplomatic role for eight years after he was supposedly stopped being an official trade envoy. And it it is really interesting to, if you look at the Jeffrey Epstein scandal and the Arab Spring, that the timelines are actually quite similar. So like you say, Prince Andrew was, was pictured with Jeffrey Epstein I think it was at the end of 2010, and then the picture came out early 2011, when the revolutions were, were, were kicking off in the Middle East. And there was some controversy then about Prince Andrew's meetings with the Tunisian dictatorship and so on. So there was a bit of flack in the press. And, and by the middle of 2011, he renounced this official trade envoy role. But like you say, he was able to basically carry on doing the same thing for another eight years. It was only the, the BBC Newsnight interview that, that finally seems to put a stop to that. But we found he was still listed as a patron of a Omani British Friendship Association alongside the current ruler of Oman and the British ambassador. So it's still totally not clear whether he's he's fully stepped back from from all aspects of that that role. And, and clearly he 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 has a a huge network of of contacts that he may well still be in touch with. The Royals, of course, are in the spotlight at the moment because of Harry and Meghan's interview with Oprah Winfrey. Your story on Declassified UK hasn't had anything like the same kind of take-up by the, the mainstream media. Arguably, this is just an important story as anything that's come out of Harry and Meghan's interview. I think the way that the British press covers the, the UK monarchy is is often very kind of servile and and sycophantic. I think there's definitely a lack of understanding about the role that the British royal family play in our foreign policy and in our arms trade. And that was something that at Declassified we wanted to highlight through this series of articles. That's Phil Miller from the investigative website Declassified UK. 
I'm Adrian Goldberg, and I hope you've enjoyed listening to this episode of the Byline Times podcast as much as I have making it. If you did, then please think about taking out a subscription to the Byline Times. Only costs £36 a year, and for that you get a great monthly paper. You also help to fund this podcast as well as our website. Get more details on how to subscribe at bylinetimes.com. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next week.